Now this is a lecture about metrology and in the area of metrology we think about sensors and, and data values coming out of these sensors. But you know sometimes these data values are maybe not of the main interest, it is more like the data values is representing uh, the outcome of an experiment and this experiment is supposed to reveal uh, a function, a, de a data dependency. And this dependency, this function is what we are actually aiming for and what we want to measure. And in order to more exemplify what I'm, what I'm talking about, I would like to give you this uh, simple example. What we see here in this diagram is a data acquisition system that is a, a computer or a, some smaller embedded computer that can um, control the temperature of, a, of an enclosed chamber, kind of a climate chamber. And we have a heating that can be controlled um, from uh, uh, yeah, some kind of external power supply that is controlling this heating filament and then there's a feedback uh, with the temperature sensor uh, so that the, the uh, data acquisition system can also know and, and control the temperature and easily change the temperature from, from different uh, ranges. And uh, uh, the object that we are interested in to measure and, and analyze is the test under unit or the un unit under test. And this is a temperature dependent resistor that shows a function uh, of resistance uh, being dependent on the temperature itself. And the whole idea here is that while we are changing the temperature within a certain range, then at the same time as we are changing the temperature in a very controlled and exact way, since we have a feedback loop where we also can measure the temperature, um, then uh, during this uh, variation of the temperature we are at the same time measuring the resistance of this uh, temperature dependent resistor. And from a set of uh, uh, different temperatures and a set of different uh, resistance values then we can develop uh, a function that are describing uh, the resistance as a function of the temperature. So it's a kind of an automated experiment where the outcome of the experiment is the function that we are seeking for. And for the more general case and for the further development and explanation of uh, the procedures and the methods for, for uh, uh, analyzing this function, uh, we can suppose that there is a measurement system uh, that has an output y of a simple process described by the function y is equal the function f of x which is controlled by the input parameter x. So input to the process is x and output from this process is y. And the function f is of x is described in this process. The outcome of this measurement must be the function f rather than the measured values y as I tried to explain before. And how then do we determine the function f? This is the main question for this video presentation. Uh, you must know or assume a kind of a dependency could be linear, quadratic, logarithmic. What you can then determine are the parameters for this assumed function such that the difference from the assumed function and the measured values are minimized. And on this slide we see two uh, examples of uh, mathematical dependencies. On the right side there is a, a, an exponential dependency and on the left side we have a linear dependency, like a straight line. And this is the application of voltage uh, and uh, current. And the uh, uh, dependency between voltage and current being the resistance. And we are actually aiming for measuring the resistance in this case, which is the, the mathematical dependency between voltage and current. And this measurement is based on a large number of measured values for both resistance and voltage. The values that you see here uh, on these green uh, dots. And for e each one of these uh, uh, measurement values we estimate the error, uh, the distance to the line and then we square the sum of the all errors and in total for this particular measurement the, uh, the total error, this uh, 
square of error, this epsilon was estimated to about 42 and the resistance was method to 101 ohms and on the right side there is an exponential dependency of minus t divided by tau and this dependency multiplied by the constant of a a level constant and uh, in this case we have two parameters it is uh, tau and it is a and a was estimated to 9.75 volts and tau was uh, estimated to 0 0.031 seconds which is a time constant so we have the time on one axis and we have the voltage on the other axis so this could be a, a way of measuring a time constant from an rc uh, uh, network output and uh, you, again we see a large number of data points uh, that has been used for minimization of the total uh, square error and the total square error in this case was uh, estimated to about 10.5 so these are two examples of uh, functions and dependencies that are estimated and then we are minimizing for the, the, the least square error most likely in one of your earlier uh, physics labs you have uh, uh, done some experiments maybe as in this case on, on current and voltage and uh, tabulated a number of, of measured values and printed this onto a piece of paper pre preparing like a manual graph and then doing this uh, curve fitting by putting a ruler on top of this measured data and try to, to minimize the, the error and the distance from each one of these data points to the line that you are drawing using this ruler. And uh, if you are using uh, mathematical uh, numerical simulation tools like MATLAB or LabVIEW, uh, then there are usually built-in functions for doing this automatic fitting of parameterized curves. But how to compute this uh, curve fitting in an embedded measurement system without the aid of simulation tools such as Lab MATLAB or LabVIEW? That is the kind of uh, questions I would like to raise right now. But before I even try to answer that question, I would like to present for you the traditional way of doing uh, curve fitting by least square minimization. You see here a, a table of, of data. These are the input data to the process. Uh, and these are the measured output data from the process. And we are supposing that we have a, a, a dependency that the output values y is equal to the function f of x. And we can then define the error epsilon as the sum of the square errors, which are the distance between the measured output values and the uh, assumed function values uh, uh, computed from the input x of i. And we sum uh, these square errors from uh, ranging from i equal to 1 to r. And we ex uh, expect now or suppose that the, the, the relation is a straight line, it's a linear dependency. So f of x is equal to c0 plus c1x. And then this will result then in a system of uh, equations. So c0 plus c1x1 is equal to y1m and so on. And c0 uh, plus c1xr is equal to yrm. So it will be a, a large overdetermined equation system. And if we now also include the uh, uh, definition for our straight line c0 plus c1x, then the expression for the uh, sum of square errors epsilon will look like this. And now the f it is rather a function uh, epsilon dependent on c0 and c1 and we are seeking for the values of the parameters c0 and c1 that will uh, result in the lowest possible value for the uh, for this sum of square errors and the way to find this uh, parameter c0 and c1 is to perform a partial derivation and seek for the zero derivatives being the the extreme value points uh, and the partial derivative of the epsilon with respect to c0 will be looking like this. The number 2 here is the constant is stemming from this square. 
and when we are partial uh, computing the partial derivatives with respect to c1 then we also get the inner derivatives of xe and now the question that we should ask ourselves is is it really possible now to solve this problem also using linear linear algebra techniques because linear algebra is the kind of tools we need in order to perform efficient computation in computers yeah and the answer to this question is of course yes as i have indicated earlier it is possible to use techniques of linear algebra to perform least square minimization and i'm now planning to show you by the example of a straight line this simple line equation that if we are developing something that we call a pseudo inverse in uh, linear algebra i will show you this later on and apply this pseudo inverse uh, then uh, we will reach a result in the end that is uh, the same as when we are applying this least square minimization by solving for the partial derivatives that we assign to zero in the traditional way um, this uh, will be a, a a proof that it is equal for the case of a, a line equation but it will not be like a general rock solid proof that it is applicable if for 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 any kind of uh, equation and function that you would like to uh, minimize for but uh, at least i will try to make it likely that it is possible to use this uh, so have a look at these equations here uh, these are the input values that we feed to the input process according to the previous model and these are the the coefficients for the line equation that we are seeking for and these are the output values from the process and we can denote this by linear algebra as a uh, with matrix multiplication of c equal to m and then we call this the observation matrix corresponding to the input to the process and this is the coefficient matrix corresponding to the coefficients that we are seeking for and m uh, is the data matrix the output from the process and it is the coefficient matrix that we are seeking for and this equation system is typically overdetermined and has no solution because the observation matrix uh, then is uh, non-quadratic and a non-quadratic matrix you cannot compute the inverse for and here comes a small magic with this uh, matrix equations that i want to show you this is the uh, the basic equation that we start from a multiplied with c equal to m where a is then the observation matrix c is the coefficient matrix and m is the data matrix and now we can multiply uh, from the left side uh, on both sides of this equation with the transpose of a uh, like this and then in fact you know when you are multiplying a matrix a with its transpose uh, a t then the result will always be quadratic and that allow us to compute the inverse of this expression and we can apply we can multiply with the uh, with the uh, inverse on both sides from the from the left side the both sides of the equation from the left side which will then eliminate uh, the equation on the left side to be only c and this is uh, uh, the the inverse of this uh, a multiplied with transpose that we also multiply from the left side on the right side of the equation uh, so in the end we have that uh, uh, c equals this uh, what we call a p s multiply with m and then a p s is this expression that we see here based on the transpose and the inverse of the transpose of the matrices uh, and this a p s is what we call the pseudo inverse so a p s the pseudo inverse is equal to this expression and the idea now is that I'm going to use the simple example of this straight line and I'm planning to show you that the coefficients matrix C is equal to this uh, pseudo inverse multiplied with the uh, data matrix corresponds to the least square minimization in the same way as we developed in the very early beginning with uh, uh, solving for the uh, square sum error the sum of the square error 
and performing partial uh, derivation and solving for the uh, der partial derivatives being equal to zero to find these extreme value points, the minimum value. And the idea here is that this magic trick with the uh, matrices will result in, in the same. So then again we start from this uh, general equation system that looks like this. This again is the uh, observation matrix, the coefficient matrix and the data matrix. And from previous slide uh, that we developed on this uh, pseudo inverse, we had this equation that were looking like this, uh, that was a, a part of the development. And the idea now is that I'm going to uh, develop an expression for uh, the right side and also an expression for the, the uh, left side. And in the end, this will be uh, equal to the uh, least square minimization. But we can start to develop the result for uh, A uh, multiplied with its transpose. So this is the, the transpose of the, uh, of the observation matrix and this is the observation matrix. And uh, the matrix multiplication will look like this and it will be a square uh, quadratic matrix as I indicated before. And it will always be. And we can now continue on the next slide with uh, development, development of, of this uh, equation. So by using the result from previous slide, then uh, we, we had the result for the, the uh, AT multiplied with A, corresponds to this uh, result from previous slide, and now we are multiplying this with the uh, coefficient matrix C, and it will generate this result. Hmm. And then the, uh, the transpose of the observation matrix multiplied with the data matrix, uh, is this expression. This is the, the transpose of the uh, observation matrix and after multiplication you will end up in this result. Mm. Um, now the idea is that we are going to make a substitution for this expression and this expression into the equation that we have from slide 10. This one. But, but before we do this we may do a small rearrangement so that we get all, uh, both of these expressions on the uh, left side and then we have the zero on the right side. This is allowed to do. And now on the next slide we are going to make the, the substitution uh, for this expression, expression coming from uh, this result and making a substitution for this expression uh, coming from this result. This is the idea. So when we do this, uh, we will get this kind of result that is equal to zero. And this is the result that we previously developed for uh, minimization by, by least square uh, optimization, uh, developing for the uh, partial derivatives with respect to C0 and C1, and we were solving for the partial derivatives being equal to zero. Mm -hmm. And this equation system is that is then equal to the one that we have shown before on slide, on slide 8 and based on the minimization by solving for the partial uh, derivatives. It's a little bit of a magic trick I think but it, it is shown here to be true for this simple line equation. So what I just showed you here was that you can use this linear algebra te technique uh, and matrices, matrix computations for uh, solving the least square minimization on a straight line, straight line equation. But indeed you can apply the same uh, technique for curve fitting even on, on higher order polynomials uh, on curves. And even you can use it on, on exponential dependencies. And I'm now planning to show you how you can uh, make a linearization of uh, an exponential dependency and apply the same kind of least square minimization techniques. So have a look at this graph that I also showed you in the beginning of this video presentation. It, it is a, a voltage uh, dependency with a time and it seems like it could be a discharging of a capacitor, an RC circuit. Uh, discharging with a time constant tau. And there is this amplitude of the voltage. 
the thing is that if you if you compute the logarithm on the voltage then this dependency will turn into a linear dependency and this uh, possibility is something that we are going to, to use uh, to allow for a least square minimization of a linear dependency so we apply linearization into a, a, a linear dependency and a linear equation system uh, so a linear curve fitting can be applied even on exponential functions however the function must then be transformed into linear relation and this uh, means that the function must be rewritten into linear combination of the coefficients c0 and c1 the same kind of coefficients c0 and c1 that we were using before in our previous example on least square fitting uh, least square minimization of, uh, of a straight line <coughs> So what we do here is that we compute the logarithm on both the left side and on the right side of, of this equation. And then it turns out to look like this, the logarithm of the, the A, the observation matrix, and minus uh, T divided by lambda, where C0 then corresponds to this logarithm of the uh, observation matrix, and C1 corresponds to minus 1 divided by lambda. And we can define now the, the general e equation system and the general overdetermined equation system. But the difference now is that this data matrix, uh, before we use the data matrix, we need to compute the logarithm of these data values. And we are now uh, solving for the C0 and C1, these parameters that will uh, uh, minimize the square error for a straight line. And we have the same general equation system ACM uh, equal to M and this can be solved using the same kind of pseudo inverse that I showed you before and when we have solved this pseudo inverse and we have uh, we have uh, been minimizing for the uh, the best fit of uh, the coefficients C0 and C1 then we can compute uh, the parameters for this exponential dependency the uh, uh, level constant a is equal to uh, the exponential of uh, c0 and lambda is equal to minus 1 divided by c1 yeah now you have learned how to do uh, curve fitting uh, by matrix computations in linear algebra which is a, a general tool that you can apply also in an embedded system where you don't have the access of uh, MATLAB or, or LabVIEW or any kinds of simulation tools, just pure computations. Uh, on the other hand, if you are only planning to use these simulation tools in the end, it could be good to, to no have a, a good basic knowledge about how this is done. And uh, certainly you will need uh, the techniques of linearization that I showed you in the end of this video presentation. So I hope you enjoyed this. I'll be back.